said that I would give you silver or gold or that you would never feel the fire or shiver in the cold but I did say you'd never walk through this world alone and I did say this world your home I never said that fear wouldn't find you in the night or that loneliness was something you'd never have to fight but I did say I'd be right there by your side And I did say I'd always help you fight Cause you know I made a promise That I intend to keep My grace will be sufficient time of need my love will be the anchor that you can hold on to this is the promise this is the promise I've made to you I never said that friends would never turn their backs on you or that the world around you wouldn't see you as a fool but I did say like me you'd surely be despised and I did say found the wise I didn't say you'd never taste the bitter kiss of death or have to walk through chilly Jordan to enter into rest but I did say I'd be waiting right on the other side I dry every tear you cried Cause you know I made a promise That I've prepared a place And someday sooner than you think You'll see me face to face And you'll sing with the angels Altitude. This is the promise. This is the promise I've made to you. So just keep on walking. Don't turn to the left or right. And in the midst of darkness. Let this be your light That hell can't separate us And you're gonna make it through This is the promise This is the promise I've made to you I've made to you. Thank you so much, Miss Taylor. If you will open your Bibles up to Matthew chapter number five tonight, we're going to turn back and try to complete uh, everything that we started last week uh, with the help of the Lord there being in Matthew chapter number five. Uh, we've talked about the Beatitudes. We've talked about 
a number of things as far as what the Lord would identify as being and uh, understanding there that uh, we are to be the salt of the earth and to be able to be the light of the world. And by the way, uh, the only way to be able to do it is to do it God's way. Amen. Just because you carry a Bible and just because you go to church does not mean that you are the salt of the, the earth. I mean, you got you to gotta be submissive to the Lord. You got to let the Lord lead you and guide you. And respond that way. And then we come to where he begins to deal with the law. We'll start reading tonight if I could. The Bible says there in verse number 21 of chapter number 5. The book of Matthew. The Bible says this. It says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But. I say unto you that whosoever is angry with a brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say unto his brother Raka or Reka shall be in danger of counsel. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and there rememberest that there, thy brother hath ought against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar. And go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother. And then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly. Whilst thou art in the way with him. Lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge. And the judge deliver thee to the officer. And thou be uh, cast into prison. Verse 26. Verily I say unto thee. Thou shalt by no means come out thence. Till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Now. You can stop there for a moment. You go back, I want you to be able to think about the Lord as he begins to speak here, if you want to say it that way, as he revealed himself of being one to be able to come not to extinguish the law, but to fulfill the law. We understand that as he began to speak, he pretty much had opened up and he says, you have heard that it was said by them of old time. In other words, there was people that was quoting and knowing scripture and saying a lot of things, but yet sometimes when they said it, the Pharisees, they would twist it sometimes to be able to be what they wanted it to be. And then Jesus, as you notice, he says in verse number 22, he says, but I say unto you, in other words, I'm not coming to God contradict the law. Uh, we learn and study what the White Bible says, the Word of God, that the law itself is the schoolmaster to be able to teach us uh, that we are lost. And by the way, because of that, we understand that we have a need of a Savior. So by accepting Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, what happens is we realize we not, cannot live up to the law. So therefore, because of that sin, we need a substitute. And then that's what the Bible says, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in him. So by trusting in Christ, we're able to be able to overcome the failure that we don't have. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not a works that you and I have. It's through a relationship of the Lord Jesus Christ. So then what he says here is he says, but I say unto you, in other words, it's not just the law we're going to go deeper he says you're going to watch me you're going to learn from me and that's how the Lord begins to teach here he begins to unfold these things and the first thing that he speaks of when he speaks about the laws he speaks about the sixth commandment that thou shall not kill thou shall not commit murder that's what he's telling us and he's bringing us to our attention because what he's doing is he's speaking about the way that the Pharisees had literally twisted it to where it was fitting their lifestyle. And as long as they didn't slay somebody, as long as uh, they didn't take somebody's life, the Pharisee could make themselves a lot better than those who did. But you and I understand that sin is sin. It makes no difference if it's bitterness. It makes no sense if it's, if it's anger. It makes no sense if it's murder, if it's an adultery, uh, whatever it may be, sin is sin. And every sin, your sin, my sin, is what put Jesus on the cross of Calvary. So we understand the significance of knowing the equality, if you want to say it that way, of the sin. So Jesus says, do not be judgmental and think you're better than somebody else just because you haven't committed murder. He said, it goes deeper than that. And if you've so much been angry and not got right, you're as guilty if you haven't dealt with it as the one who has committed murder. Jesus says, so it's not easier. I've come to fulfill the law, therefore it makes it harder. So he, he clarifies and he begins to go through all these things. And he starts talking about the steps. 
And these steps that he says is in verse 22. He says, but I say to you that whosoever is angry with his, uh, with his uh, brother without, uh, with, without cause shall be in danger of judgment. And then he says, whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka. In other words, uh, to be able to uh, speak unto him as their lower, if you want to say it that way. And then he says, uh, to be able to call somebody a fool. He, he says over and over and over, these are the steps to murder. If you are guilty of the anger or uh, having a God like image for you to say that somebody is a fool and don't trust God listen you and I don't know the heart of men so the moment that we begin to act like we're God is the moment that we think we can do whatever we want to do and we don't have to give an answer to God and then that's when men go beyond the boundaries to say well you know what it is what it is God knows my heart I'm just going to deal with it and anger can lead you to literally murdering somebody and taking their life he says so it's not just the act of taking the life it's even the step steps to get you there. If you do not deal with it, you can be wrong when you stand before God. So Jesus does not tiptoe. He doesn't just make it easy. So he went through the text and he comes to verse number 23. He says, therefore, because you know that this is where it's at, there was three things that I gave you last week. Number one, you evaluate, evaluate you the evaluation of our personal relationships. In other words, now that you know that the steps of these things now that you know the steps of these things make you just as guilty, I want you to evaluate your own relationships. And I ask you again this week, are you and I guilty of murder? Is there anybody that we hate, that we can't talk to, that we can't make things right with? And can I tell you this, it's awfully easy to be able to hide your anger. And it's never really seen until you blow up or until you gossip or you say something behind somebody's back. You can hide it real well when you come to church on Sunday morning and Sunday night. But when you, you and I stand before God, we cannot hide it when we stand before God. So we need to stop and we need to evaluate and be able to ask ourselves, am I guilty of being angry with somebody and being in a state of mind? Then we talked about the emphasis of peaceful reconciliation. He said, literally, the Bible says right after that, in verse number 24, he says, Leave uh, there thy guilt before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. So now he says, this is what you need to do. You need to be able to drop everything that it is that you're trying to bring to me and don't do it. In other words, if you think that you're singing and you're pleasing me, but you have all in your heart against your brother, you're not doing anything for you and God. If you're trying to teach or preach or you're trying to be spiritual and serve, but yet you know that you've got hatred or you've got alt in your heart against your brother and you have not made it right. God is just simply saying this, if you can't be right with your brethren, don't think you're going to come to me and be right. It's not going to be that way. Because when you are right with God, you'll be right with the brethren. And he's teaching that. So what comes of it is we're literally like hypocrites because we don't think everybody else sees it, but yet we think we're serving the Lord and then we lose our joy. And we wonder what happened. Well, what happened was we never dealt with the sin that was in our life. So he says that there's an emphasis on peaceful reconciliation. And it led to the last thing last week, the expectation of proper return. And then he says in verse 24, he says, leave thy gift and go before the altar, go thy way. And then he says, then to be able to come and to be able to offer thy gift. So that brings us to where we are tonight, to the place to where now he begins to tell us how in the world do we actually make it right? What is it that we need to do to be able to make things right? Now, let me say this before I dive into it. The Lord is teaching us that just because you don't blow up does not mean that you're not guilty. Just because you don't cuss does not mean that you're not guilty. Do you understand the examination of our heart is truly something we must do and slow down because you might hide it well and you might not let your temper go, but that don't mean that you and I have over, uh, I overcome, if you want to say it that way, the anger. We need to really, really consider why things don't feel the way they, they used to feel sometimes. I've seen a lot of people in just my time since I've been saved, they come to the house of God, they have sang in the choir, they went to Sunday school, they shook hands at the door, they've done a lot of things. They're like, you know, I don't know, I just don't feel it like I used to feel. It's not the same. Sometimes they blame it on the people. Sometimes they'll blame it on the teacher. Sometimes the preacher. Sometimes the choir. When the truth be told, it's black and white, friend. God says, listen, don't think you're going to come and be right with me and you're going to receive my joy and, and be happy all the time when you're living in sin even though nobody sees it. Now I want you to hear me when I say that because this is crucial. 
Sometimes the most miserable people we know are people that are saved and are living with anger that they've never dealt with. They have never dealt with. And it's so easy to be able to outsource that problem. And God is not saying, I don't want nothing to do with you. What God is saying is, obviously, we should worship, we should praise, we should serve the Lord. But if you're going to do it, you must do it God's way. You can't do it your way. you got to trust God and always trust God. If you believe that, say amen. A lot of times Christians sometimes will say this, well, I'm not going to go to them because I know they're not, they're not going to make it right. They're, they're not going to accept my apology. Listen to me. Listen to me. I've learned a long time ago that our job is not to predict what's supposed to be done, but rather it's supposed to practice what's supposed to be done. We're not, we, we got a lot of us, and I'm talking about us. I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about us as children of God. We got a lot of us on a regular basis, we're predicting what we think is going to happen and it hinders us from going because there's two things. Number one, it's either it does happen and we begin to boast saying, well, I knew I was going to be right. And then all of a sudden it stirs a, a house fire, if you want to say it that way, right? But see, that's, that's not the case. You cannot, nor should you predict what the outcome is. The outcome is always determined by God. Our responsibility is to practice the Word of God, not predict what the Word of God's going to do. And until we get to that place, things aren't going to get any better in our lives. So we must do exactly what God says, when He says it, and how He says it. So, even though it's easy, even though it's uh, very uh, common to be able to overlook these things, there's some things that God says for us to do. Number one tonight, as we finish this, what is God saying? Number one, there is a proper response. There's a proper response. Notice the Bible says there in verse number 25. Verse 25, he literally says that you do agree with thine adversary quickly. In other words, you're to go with them and to be able to make things right. You're to be able to go directly to them, not somebody else, not uh, a friend at work, uh, not even another brethren in the church. Listen, you don't want everybody sharing your mess all through the church, so why should you be sharing somebody else's mess in the church? And by the way, we're not dealing with problems. This is exactly where we should be in Matthew chapter number 5. Can I get a witness? We've been preaching right here for like the last 10 to 15 weeks or however long it's been. We've been in Matthew chapter number 5. It just so happens this is where we are. But I think it's because the Lord knows that on a, uh, every once in a while, on a certain occasion, we need to be reminded that the same thing that we think is good for somebody else is the same thing that should be good and should be right for us. Amen. I was listening to a preacher preach the other day and he's preaching on a completely different subject but boy it really got a hold of my heart. It captivated my mind and, uh, and he was talking about delu diluting things. Uh, he was talking about diluting the Word of God and he brought out such a strong, he's not an old preacher, he's a younger preacher and he got talking about it and he said literally, he said the reason why a lot of us being children of God dilute the Word of God is because what happens is, is when something in the Bible pertains to us and we want to overlook it because it's in our family or in our home, we begin to dilute it and listen, that does not make it right. It never makes it right. Just because it's in our house, just because it's in our church, just because we're going to feel the effects of it, that does not mean that we should overlook it. That's not what we should do. If anything, we ought to be able to love the way that God and Christ has loved us and love them through that, but understand that it's the truth, what, that sets them free. And because of that, we get all things on the table. You and I know that if a marriage is ever reconciled and ever restored, it's only by truth. It's not by covering things up and and letting it go. No, you cannot shadow that. You're not, you're not going to overlook that. you got to expose everything. So he says that when you come, there's a proper response, and that response is to go and agree with that adversary. So who is the adversary? Well, it's very simple. Whoever it is that you have the issue with is your adversary. Whoever it is that you have unresolved anger with, and by the way, they might not even know that you're mad at them. Listen, some of y'all are married. Have you ever had your spouse be angry with you? And you say, well, honey, I didn't even know you were upset with me. Sometimes that really happens in real life. Or maybe it's the only, my marriage is the only one that happens, right? There's sometimes things happen with Tim. And I'm like, well, honey, I didn't even know that, that bothered you. I didn't mean it that way. But what happens is if we don't deal with that, 
that little bit, that little bit plants a seed. And then before you know it, there's a wedge and there's pressure that's against us. And then there is a, a hindrance. There is a, a wall, if you will, that's in the home because uh, a wife or a husband thinks the other spouse thinks they know what's wrong. And the truth be told, they never know what's wrong. The same thing happens in the house of God. There's a lot of times that somebody done something or they did not do something and it bothers you. Listen to me. And they don't know it bothered you. And here you and I get sometimes thinking, well, I know they know they bother me. Friend, they really might not know that they bothered you. They might not. But you know who loses their joy? It's us. It's us. So that's why you go to that brother or that sister in Christ or that spouse or that family member and say, hey, listen, I just need to get something on my chest. You said something the other day and it caught me off guard and I just can't get no peace about it. And you know what? One of two things are going to happen. They're going to look at you and say, that's exactly right. And that's what I thought to say about you. And then if that happens, you can DDT them in Jesus' name. Amen. But that's not what's going to happen. Sometimes, listen, sometimes they'll say, brother, I didn't even know. Or I didn't even mean it that way. I never forget there have been times in the past in the ministry where, where Tiffany would literally say to me, do you know what you sounded like? Do you know how you said that? In my mind, I'm like, I, I didn't say it mean. I'm just, I'm thinking for the next step. So it's not about being emotional, right? It's just about getting the job done. So I say things. And I'm guilty of that with a lot more than anybody with Brother Daniel. Sometimes I just talk to him, you know, and I just feel like two soldiers on the battlefield. I'm not, I'm not trying to rub your ego. I'm not trying to emotionally help you none. I'm just telling we got to get the job done. Let's get the job done. And we're able to talk that way, right? But we never know the way we sound. We never know the way we come off. And sometimes Sometimes you might rub somebody the wrong way and never know it. So when that brother or sister comes to you, listen, they're trying to do it the Bible way. And there's two people that have to make a decision. The first person is to be able to come and to be able to ask what's really going on. And the second person to be able to do their job to be able to make it right. And once you agree, and listen, there's a second step. Child of God, independent Baptist, King James only. Let me tell you, there's a second step. If somebody repents, it's not your job to judge their heart. Man, I could drive and sit there for about an hour right here. We need to know. You and I do not know if they're really repenting. It's a change of attitude which leads to a change of action. I understand what repentance is. But at that moment, friend, if they come to you because of your submission to the Lord, you know what you and I ought to do? Well, let it go. Praise the Lord. Don't even worry about it. It's over with. It's done. It's under the blood. Amen. It's under the blood. But too many of us, too many of us are carrying this heavy baggage around. And we're not just going to that person and just talking to them and making it right. And before you know it, it brings such a wedge where not only are you going to church and sitting in different places, but then you're not serving together, you're not eating together, you don't smile, you don't even want to laugh at each other's jokes because you don't want them to think that you're okay with them and you're just trying to be able to play it off. Friend, your countenance reveals a lot more sometimes than you think it does. Amen, brother Jason, that's good preaching. And you say, I don't believe that. Well, it happens in our marriages all the time. Sometimes I say, Tiff, what's wrong? Ain't nothing wrong. I say, Tiffany, what's wrong? I ain't nothing wrong, you know. And she might even say it and say it sweet with her backs to me. I, I know when something's wrong. So then if something's wrong, you know what I do? I go down, there's this place called Black, uh, Black Mountain Chocolate. It's downtown. They got these little, uh, they got these little s'more tarts. You go down there and get one of them and butter her up and it don't take her long. She'll say, well, you hurt my feelings the other day. And I say, I knew something was wrong. I knew something was wrong. But here's the deal. When people try, we got to realize and remember they're trying to do what God told them to do. And you know, the person that's usually the most miserable is the one that knows that there's a situation and an issue and they can't make it right. Do you know that humility, and you've probably done this to somebody else, have you ever went to somebody and you tried to make it right and they didn't, they brushed it off? Do you know the humility that it took for you and I to swallow our pride and say, brother, my feelings were hurt or that bothered me. It takes a lot. It takes a lot for us to be able to do that. We should respect them and we should honor the Lord in the way that we respond to that. So there's a proper response. Now, what is it? Notice, there's an action that's taken. 
What's that action, Brother Jason? He says that if thou agree. So in other words, you're to be able to agree uh, with them. So he makes it plain, agree with thine adversary. The Bible says in Romans 12, 18, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. So Whatever it takes, do whatever you got to do to be able to make things right and agree so you can move on and let things go. Now, I'm not saying condone somebody's actions. I'm not saying to overlook some things. I'm not saying to be able to uh, move on and, 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 and just kind of brush it under the rug. No, I'm talking about really make it right and agree and realize, friend, I didn't mean to do that. Well, that's what happened. Okay, I'm sorry and move on. How do I do that, Brother Jason? Good question. Love. Love. You listen to me. If you can't forgive somebody, you have an, you have an issue with love. Do you know why a husband does forgive a wife? Because he loves her. Do you know why a wife forgives her husband? Because she loves him. So you tell me why I know it's a different kind of love. But it's the love that God puts in our heart. You tell me when a brother or a sister or the brethren comes to us and we can't let it go and just say it is what it is. It's fine. No big deal. I'm sorry. Whatever it may be. The only reason that can't ever happen is because the way we say we love isn't really the way we love. Love conquers everything. It conquers everything. And if we love the way we should love, listen, it don't matter what anger there is, love will conquer. It don't matter the bitterness there is, love will conquer. It don't matter the jealousy there is, love will conquer. Anything that we deal with, love will conquer. Love is always greater. The greatest of these is charity. Charity is the greatest. So he says there's a proper action that is taken. But then notice this, and this is key. He says this in verse number 25. He says, agree with thine adversary next week. Next Sunday, after I talk to somebody about it, <laughs> after I talk to my husband and my wife, you know, after I watch and see their actions and see if they even knew they'd done something wrong to me. No, it says quickly. So when you and I are properly responding to this, not only is there action that's taken, but listen to me, there's an available time that we must, in other words, this is what he's saying, while there is still time, time is ticking. There might come a day where it gets so far that that anger turns into bitterness. And before you know it, a root always produces a fruit. A root always produces a fruit. So if we don't deal with that, just think of the discord. Think of the division. Everybody with me tonight, I know it's quiet, but friend, we, we all deal with this stuff. We all deal with it. I've seen it. And listen, I'll go a step beyond. I, I, I've seen it not only in just people and in the world and Christians and stuff like us. I've seen it in preachers. I, I'll never forget. It's been a number of years ago. I, I think I, I might have been a youth pastor. I wasn't a youth pastor. I can't remember. I, I just remember we were coming home for camp. And we were up in Tennessee and we were driving back that day and uh, I was probably a youth pastor because I, I would do just about anything when I was. And we had an invitation to be able to go sing at a church. And uh, it just conveniently was on the way back from uh, uh, the Tennessee side. And we was coming through Wilkesboro. We was going to stop and we was going to have service that night. And we went. It was uh, uh, another preacher and myself that we were preaching. And uh, we got in and we preached. And it was a youth meeting. And man, our choir was in there. And we sang and praised the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. And all these things. And... Uh, and then at the end of the service, there was this gentleman that came up to me. Now, I'd never met him before. I, I, as far as I recall, I'd, I'd never seen him. I, I didn't even know who he was. I didn't even know what church he went to. He wasn't part of that church, but I didn't know anything about him. I mean, as far as I know, uh, he was just a stranger, you know, and was there for, for, for church that night. And uh, he said, can we sit down for a minute? And I said, yes, sir. You know, I mean, I didn't know. I mean, maybe he's going to need to talk about the Lord or something. I didn't know what it was. And very direct, he was very direct, and we sat down on him. And he handed me his Bible. And I thought, hmm. And I knew, I knew we were getting ready to go somewhere. And he says, uh, I want you to do me a favor. He said, I want you to take that Bible right there, and I want you to show me how two, I, I must have been pastoring. He said, how two men of God can say they're right with God, but them have an issue with each other. And I handed his Bible back and I said, sir, I can't. He said, well, how come you got an issue? And I said, well, I don't even know who it was. Knock a long story short. His pastor had publicly said to him that he had an issue with me. 
And therefore, he thought I had an issue with his pastor. He told me who his pastor was. And I said, sir, I'll be honest with you. I said, I ain't got no issue with him. I said, whatsoever, everything's fine. I said, if you want to have a meeting, I said, but now I will say this. If you'd like to come to my office, I can show you some letters of where he wrote me some letters. But I ain't never wrote a letter to him. I've never had any issue. But here's why I say this to you. Because it's not just amongst the brethren. There are, there are men that are under shepherds. That sometimes it comes to a place, if we don't deal with our issues either, we can live in that sin too. And then we get to be bitter. And listen, then we get to be jealous. And then sometimes, and I'm not condoning stuff, listen to me. But sometimes you can believe, and you listen to what I'm about to say. You can believe a lie for so long that it almost becomes to be the truth to you. Now you know that, uh, that he was an older man of God. Listen, that never came out of my mouth. He probably assumed that I was upset with him. It was a different situation, and and I put two and two together, and I knew why he probably thought it. But I never even even talked to the man. Matter of fact, he was almost like a a spiritual hero to me. There's a lot of times when I got saved, I looked up to a lot of men of God, and I'd go to their meetings and different things. I thought, Lord Jesus, I never have nothing wrong with him. But sometimes, if you and I don't deal with an issue, The devil will plant that seed for so long that you'll almost believe that it is the truth that there's a problem. And I remind you, the devil is a liar. He is a liar. And you and I might come to church on a Sunday morning, we might think, well, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, they got an issue. All right, so-and-so. Friend, you don't know they got an issue. Unless you've went to them, you've never given them a chance. Now, can I confess something? Can I confess something? I'm not perfect either. And I I can promise you as I read this and I study this and and I go through different things, listen, it convicts me. I have to think about it. I have to make sure. You remember I told you at the beginning of the year that every time I, 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 I come through a new year, I pray about different things and I go through different things. As a matter of fact, we, die, we dove into the Beatitudes and I, I pick a verse, I pick a word. and It's just something I do that was challenged by a mentor and other men of God to be able to help me with a focus, with a vision. And one of my Bible verses for this year is this, Blessed are they that are pure in heart. For they shall see God. Do you know what to know why? Because a lot of times when we have unresolved issue, you cannot be pure at heart. You can't be pure at heart. So as a pastor, as a Christian, as a father, as a husband, I've had to check myself. Because look, when I stand behind this pulpit, unless I give you the stink eye, you don't know what's in my heart. Right? I mean, seriously, I'm, not, I'm trying to be silly, but not be silly. But unless you see something, you don't really know. We must know that we give an account to God. And there's a lot of times I've had to get down, and, and I've said this before, and I'll say it again. There have been some times I'll study all week, and I'll come and sit down in my office, and I like to sit down again. I like to study again. I'll sit up here, and I'll just kind of go through things, let the Holy Ghost lead to me. And you wouldn't believe this, but I'll go all week long. I mean, the sermon, the message that God puts on my heart would be completely about something else. And Sunday morning, I'll come up here, and I'll be getting ready to be able to go to the pulpit and preach, and I'm praying, God help me. And somehow or another, God will convict me about something with him. And I mean, it'll be, it'll be, it'll be four, five, six, seven o'clock in the morning. I'm either sending a text message. I'm calling them saying, hey, I, baby, I just need to tell you, I'm sorry. I, I just want to make sure everything's all right. Why? Because we get convicted when we get in the presence of God and we must submit to that. So all of us fall guilty to this. We all fall guilty, but that's why he said there is a proper response. Deal with it. Go to them, but deal with it quickly. He said quickly. Second thing, There's possible ramifications. What do you mean by that? If you don't deal with it, there's consequences. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 25. Agree with thy adversary quickly whilst thou art in the way with him. There it is. Why? Because there'll be a time when he's not there. Very next part of that verse. Lest at any time the adversary deliver thee unto the judge. Lest. In other words, he brings us to this place where there can be issues. So what are these issues? Well, these consequences could be this. It could be an escalated problem that happens. See, sometimes it might start off little, but have you ever noticed when a mess started off a little mess, but you didn't deal with that mess and it ended up being a big mess? You ever dealt with that before? Why? Because we don't deal with it quickly. Now listen, this is good for marriage, good for church, this is good for family and friends. I'm telling you, he said, this is the way that you live. It's not just, thou shalt not kill. No, friend, you shouldn't even be angry. And if you are, you should get it right. That's why Jesus said it. 
So there's escalated problems. Things begin to blow up. And before you know it, there's a great divide. There's a great division. And we know there's only one author of confusion, and it ain't God. It's the devil himself. It's the devil himself. All right? And then it leads to this. External people. What do you mean by that? Notice what the Bible says, that he will deliver thee into the judge, the judge deliver thee to an office. In other words, it begins to go beyond. So now it goes from being dealt with in the house of God to where there's other people. And then before you know it, believe it or not, if you don't deal with it in the house of God, it might go out to the law. And before you know that, everything else begins to happen. And now all of a sudden you're put in a position you can't get out of because it escalated so much, that it's blown up so much that a simple sit-down conversation ain't good enough. So now you get all these people involved, and I don't care what kind of authority they got, and I don't care what they know. If they're not saved, and they don't know what the Bible says, they can have the law of the country, but that don't mean they know what's best for your situation. You understand what I'm saying to you? We should deal with these things quickly, and that's what he says. Friend, it's not just about the law. I came to fulfill the law. Get it right. Live like Jesus lived. And then it comes to extreme punishments. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says in verse number 25, thou be cast into a prison. Cast into a prison. You say, boy, that is extreme. That is extreme. How in the world could anger lead somebody to prison? There's no way. That's just an illustration. Let me ask you something. Have you ever noticed where a family, where a husband and wife, something happened? If you've ever dealt with marriages and couples or kids, We've heard stories, unfortunately, where kids feel abandoned as a, as a child. And then what happens is they end up being angry. They raise, they get raised with a chip on their shoulder. And that anger never gets dealt with. Before you know it, that bitterness, it turns into almost a wrath, to a, a vengeance. I mean, literally coming out. And they literally can take somebody's life or choose something to bring harm to themselves or somebody else. And it literally would lock them into prison. And you want to know why? Because it all started with anger. So here's the point of what I'm trying to tell you. It might not be prison. Listen, it might be bondage to a divorced home. Do you see what I'm saying? Let's look at it backwards tonight. Uh, let's go further. Let's talk about the church corporately, right? You say, well, how in the world, listen to me, how in the world could a church split? If God is God and Jesus is the answer, how could a church split? How could a youth ministry split? How could this ministry, how in the world? I, I, re, I probably would nail it down to somewhere down the line, there was two people that had an issue and then people began to take a side. And when they began to take a side, it divided the whole thing. So it's this escalated problem that all started with what? Just a little bit of anger. And here's the great, here's the great tragedy, listen to me. You know who really loses? Not just those people. But now their two who had an issue turns to 30 or 40 that now have an issue. That ministry is resolved. Now you go to a church. Let's say that church got 150. So now 150 has been affected plus all the kids and the offspring in that church. All because of two people. But it don't stop there. Then they see a for sale sign. You say, now you're going, no, I'm not going too far. I'm trying, this is the ways of the devil. Then you see a for sale sign out front and literally the church is being sold because they don't have the membership to be able to do what they need to do all because of one little issue. Do you understand? You know, I don't time time the meadow. I need to hurry. But James chapter number three talks about the tongue. It talks about how it's like a fire, how it's like a beast. I mean, it literally can devour you. Listen, anger will do the same thing. I mean, it will, it will take you out and it will ruin you. And by the way, it don't have no mercy. The devil don't have no mercy. Everybody all right? I mean, this is good stuff. Listen, thank God. If you're not dealing with it, thank God. Listen, we, we can thank the Lord that everything's all right. But let's, let's be mindful of this the next time somebody comes to us or we have to go to somebody. Let's be humble and say, you know what? The reason why they're coming to me is because they want their joy to be what it needs to be. They want to be right before God, so therefore they need to be right. So let me help this brother or this sister. Let me not hinder them. How would you do that? Oh, you're dumb for thinking that. So now you call me dumb, right? I mean, I, and listen, I'm saying this, but I'm putting it in our way. Because I have learned, unfortunately, the hard way that 
you have to be careful the way you say some things. You know, I, I'll give you an illustration. I'll give you my last point. I'm done. Tiffany can come to me and she'll say, you know how he's talking about me have to go buy her something like one of those s'mores tart and everything else? And she'll say, well, you hurt my feelings. Well, you know what? I just saved the day, right? I bought a little tart. Uh, we made things right. She confessed. And then I follow with this crazy line. You ready? Well, you're just crazy. I got a couple witnesses. How many of you know, don't call your wives crazy. Okay. I, well, I'll just be the only sinner tonight. But the same way that happens in our home is the same way it can happen between us as brethren. Let's respond to them. Be careful with our words. Let me give you a third thing and I'm done. There's a prolonged reality. I'm talking about being guilty of murder. There's a prolonged reality. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 26. He says, Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. So here it is. Now there's a place to where it's complete bondage, if you want to say it that way. You're in a place to where literally it's like there is, there's nothing you can do. And you're in a place to where you can't come out, you can't do anything. It's put you in extensive trouble. It's got you to a place to where it's beyond your control. You can't handle it. And now you want to make it right, but you can't make it right. You got to deal with it. You got to deal with it because it is a prolonged reality and it will make you miserable. The second thing I wrote down this is it's an expensive toll. Did you hear what he said? He says, till thou hast paid the uttermost. So in other words, it's going to cost you a lot. Do you know what? If we don't deal with it quickly, listen to me, it'll cost you more if you don't deal with it quickly. You remember what I said when I started? Our job is not to predict the outcome of the Bible. Our job is to practice the Bible. Now listen to me for accountability, okay? Let's remember every moment that passes is a greater cost. Let's deal with it and deal with it the way God says it. Let me give you the third thing here and I'm done. And then there leaves an embarrassing testimony. And I'm finished. I'll get somebody to piano and I'm done. Listen to me. An embarrassing testimony. I don't know if you've ever dealt with anything and God said to deal with it his way but you refuse to do so and then before you know it you can get by for two weeks, three weeks, sometimes months and then all of a sudden God, what those who reap, reap what they sow. So when you deal with something and you don't deal with it the way God says deal with it and all of a sudden it becomes to be escalated and then what could have been dealt with privately between you and the Lord or you and a brother or sister in Christ, it escalates so much to where now, you remember what I said about the church for sale? Now there's a testimony that is ruined. Why? Because what, what we're here for is not our glory. It's His glory. It's His glory. Your marriage, your home, this church, our families... There, there's no such thing as a perfect marriage. But I believe the way that a husband or a wife responds to each other, the way that a, a father or a mother responds to their children, that's why the Bible says, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. In other words, don't, don't, don't get them in a place to where they're going to be angry because here's why. You do that, it, it's, it's going to cost a testimony. So then what happens, everybody blows up and then there's a bunch of anger and then here's what happens. Somebody says, well, brother so-and-so's house is not in order. No, we got to do it God's way. And I believe if we do it God's way, I believe God honors it. She begins to play again. I've, I've talked a lot about Tiffany and I, so let me just say this again. Um, and listen, I'm talking bad about me. I'm Brother Mike, you, you, you're my witness and I'm not putting it on Tiffany, that's for sure. But there's been some times that Tiffany um, will try to hint to me that something's not what it should be. You know what I do? Because I'm busy and I'm rushed, I just keep on going. And then all of a sudden I get to church. Maybe she walks by and I say, boy, you sure do look pretty. And you can tell by her demeanor she ain't smiling. I don't know if you ever see it, but I can tell it, right? Now that's passive and that's innocent, but here's what I'm saying. Now what could have been dealt with privately is dealt with publicly. But let's just say it's that young lady that's watching us or it's that young couple that's watching their pastor and pastor's wife and they're seeing the way we respond to each other. You see how your testimony can be hindered? 
right? I never forget before I really became to be pastor. I was probably a youth pastor or part-time or whatever. I remember a lot of times I would sit at the table with my pastor or with other preachers and I would listen. I still do the same. I don't talk a lot. Listen when I'm sitting around. And I would listen the way that some of those men would talk. And they didn't realize, number one, that I was just a young preacher looking to them. And because of the situations and the issues in between them, sometimes it ain't what they taught me to do. It's what God used them to teach me what not to do. You understand what I'm saying about that? And listen, I want to be a testimony, but I don't want to be a testimony because I failed God. I want to be a testimony because we honored God and we dealt with things the way God said so. Uh, I'll close with this story too. I, there's a couple that I know that was... Uh, outside of church and um, I've known them for a long time and uh, knock a long story short they split she left him for a lot of good reasons abuse adultery a lot of stuff he was lost and about a year after they split he got saved got born again but she met a good man well they had reached out and contacted us about uh, trying to be involved in the wedding and I never was able to be able to call back and do anything the very next day the gentleman called me her ex-husband and he said brother Jason he said um, he said I he didn't call me brother Jason he said Jason he said I'm gonna ask you a question he said I don't want you to do her wedding and all I had was a voicemail that asked her about that asked me about doing it and this is what he said he said, because I got my heart right and I'm asking for God to give my wife back. And it humbled me because it made me realize that so many times we let things go to where now sometimes it's almost like it seems to be too late. Now let me say this, with Jesus it's never too late. But I was thinking, wow, what love and a change in this man's life that he literally took a 180 and got right to where he's begging me not to do that wedding simply because he's been begging God to give his wife back to him. And you know how it all started? With anger. Not dealing with it. So I just asked you by invitation tonight and I'm done. Don't be passive for a moment. Is there anything in your heart between you and somebody? And unfortunately, you might be here tonight and maybe they're dead. And you can't go to them and say, I'm sorry. Well, you know what you need to do? As God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you, you need to release them of that debt they owe you. Say, Lord, let me get beyond this. Let me have my joy. Let me learn to let it go. And I believe if we do this, God will honor our homes, our ministries, our marriages. God will honor our life. But it's not if we do it our way. we got to do it God's way. Father, I love you and I thank you for the word of God. Help us, Lord, to be mindful. It is a joy and a privilege to be able to know that you've tuned in. And I pray that today that the word of God that was shared will be a blessing to you. If somehow, some way that the Lord has spoke to your heart and maybe you're uh, sitting where you are and you don't know for sure that you're saved by the grace of God and you've ever trusted Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, then I want you to know that the Word of God says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible makes it very plain. For the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You say, how do I get saved? You have to trust in Christ and Christ alone. Repent of your sin and then know as the Bible says where Jesus says, I am the way. And I pray that today that that will be your desire to be able to seek out for the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to trust Him as a Lord and Savior. If you do that today and you repent of your sins and you take Him as your Savior, would you do us a favor and contact our church office at 336-788-0551? We would love to be able to speak with you. We would love to be able to encourage you, maybe be able to help you find a local church no matter where you are today. And maybe even possibly disciple you. So we want to say thank you so much. And we are definitely going to be praying for you in this ministry that our church has. If you know you're saved and maybe the Lord spoke to you in a different way. And there's something heavy on your heart. Again, that same number, if you can contact us, we'll be so thankful to be able to reach out and be able to speak with you. 
But again, on behalf of the church and myself, thank you so much, and may God bless you.